Welcome to this month's uh, Trauma of the Month, um, where we discuss a case of traumatic cardiac arrest secondary to blunt trauma. So traumatic cardiac arrest in itself is a rare event, uh, traditionally seen as having quite poor outcomes. Uh, TARN database, the Trauma and Audit Research Network database, would suggest that the instance is only 0.6%. Uh, um, but this is an underestimate, underestimation because any patient that is uh, declared dead in a pre-hospital field won't make it onto the TARN database. So this 0.6% is for all patients who survive or make it to hospital for ongoing resuscitation. The majority of studies report survival rates between 5.1 and 7.7%. Now this is less than out-of-hospital medical cardiac arrest. However, for those that do survive uh, from their traumatic cardiac arrest, the neuro neurological outcome performance is better than the all-cause medical cardiac arrest. In terms of the management of traumatic cardiac arrest, there are a number of treatment algorithms uh, available uh, in the literature. Uh, this is from the European Resuscitation Council. It's quite complex, um, lots of things to consider. Um, so I want to draw your attention to what we refer to as the HOT protocol. So this was first described by David Lucky back in 2014 and it was designed to simplify the management of traumatic cardiac arrest. And we think about the HOT protocol, we think of the causes of traumatic cardiac arrest and we go the two H's and two T's. So we think about medical cardiac arrest, we have the four H's and four T's. In trauma, we have the two H's and two T's. And that's hypoxia and hypovolemia and tension and tamponade. And HOT protocol specifically focuses on these areas. So we're going to aggressively manage hypovolemia. We'll talk a bit more about that in a few moments. We're going to oxygenate the patient as well as we can. We're going to treat their tension pneumothorax with decompression. And we're going to consider uh, surgical management of their cardiac tamponade if we think that's likely. So this is the HOT protocol algorithm um, and just to zoom in a little bit starting at the top we're going to assess our patient and we're going to diagnose traumatic cardiac arrest or peri-arrest situation. Now if we're thinking penetrating as a cause and we're not going to discuss this today it's a topic for another another day but if we are thinking penetrating and there's lots of vital signs uh, within the last 10 minutes then we would consider doing resuscitative thoracotomy to treat a cardiac tamponade or any other intrathoracic pathology that is amenable to treatment. But that's all I'm going to discuss about um, penetrating trauma today. So moving on, um, before we go any further we need to consider in blunt trauma the possibility of a medical cause for their cardiac arrest and a classic example would be a patient who um, has been seen to veer off the road in their car and at very low speed collide with a barrier or wall. The patient themselves has no external signs of injury, airbags been deployed, they were fully restrained in the car, but yet they're in cardiac arrest and that rhythm may be VF, VT or PEA. And in these pa patients we need to consider a medical cause so that we don't go down the trauma route because the management of medical and traumatic cardiac arrest are very different. So moving on to traumatic, blunt traumatic cardiac arrest, how are we going to manage these patients? Well, we're going to follow our HOT protocols we've described. So we're going to manage hypervolemia aggressively. So we're going to control external hemorrhage. That's going to be closing the pelvis. That's going to be tourniquets for peripheral limb hemorrhage. It's going to be traction splints for femurs and long bones. And we're going to volume resuscitate the patient with blood and blood products. We're going to avoid crystalloid at all costs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. We're going to oxygenate our patients as well as possible. And depending on your skill set, that would be basic adjuncts, manoeuvres, superglottic airways, or for the anaesthetist amongst us, we're going to get an endotracheal tube down as quickly as possible to secure that airway and ventilate that patient on 100% oxygen. We're then going to move on and treat the tension pneumothorax by decompressing the chest. And again, we'll talk about that in a few moments. And as I've already mentioned, the second T was going to be our cardiac tamponade, which we're not going to discuss today. 
Once we've implemented our HOT protocol, we're then going to reassess our patients. If we have a return of spontaneous circulation pre-hospitally, we're going to make our way to the most appropriate receiving centre as quickly as possible. In hospital, we'll be considering whether or not we're stable enough to get through CT scans to get some really useful information. Failing that, we'll be heading to theatre for surgical uh, correction of the cause of the traumatic cardiac arrest, for presuming it's hypervolemia, of course. So moving on to some recommendations. So let's look at the consensus statement that was published in 2018 by the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care by the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. And they made a number of recommendations about how we should be managing traumatic cardiac arrest. The first is with regards to hypervolemia. And we should manage this aggressively with hemorrhage control, early surgical intervention and volume resuscitation. The second recommendation talks about chest compressions. And they recommend that we can interrupt chest compressions to provide definitive treatment. And what they're referring to here is the HOT protocol. So volume resuscitation, so getting venous access, getting hemorrhage control, oxygenating the patient and decompression, decompressing their chest. But just to go one step further, let's look at the best practice guidelines published last year by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. And they talk about how medical cardiac arrest interventions can be omitted completely in these trauma cases, specifically with regards to chest compressions, vasopressor use and defibrillation. And what they're referring to here is a patient who we're presuming to be in hypervolemic traumatic cardiac arrest and how that these interventions are not going to benefit the patient and they may even cause harm. Now there was a really interesting paper published last year looking at uh, animal models of hypervolemic traumatic cardiac arrest. And just to orientate you to this graph, there were five groups in the study. The first group had chest compressions only. The second group had blood product resuscitation only. The third group had saline resuscitation only. The fourth group had both chest compressions and blood resuscitation. And the fifth group had chest compressions and saline resuscitation. And you can see that all the groups that had chest compressions performed did worse. There were more dead animals in this animal model. And in fact, the, the group that had solely blood product resuscitation did the best, quite significantly so. And the take home for me from this is if you've got a patient who you who you've diagnosed hypervolemic tra traumatic cardiac arrest in, we should be resuscitating these patients with blood products and a hot protocol and we'll be omitting uh, chest compressions and we certainly will be avoiding giving them crystalloids. Recommendation three was about airway management and that we should be getting a tracheal tube, cuff tracheal tube, um, inserted as soon as possible. And recommendation four looks at how we're going to um, decompress the chest. And this should be with bilateral thoracostomies. And they should be undertaken using a surgical technique. So a finger thoracostomy followed by a tube uh, intercostal drain insertion. And finally, the, rec the fifth recommendation was about penetrating trauma and resuscitative thoracostomies, which again, as I've said, we're not going to discuss today. So this is all well and good for the management of hypervolemic traumatic cardiac arrest, but I do want to draw our attention to uh, another patient cohort, and this is patient, these are patients who've got impact brain apnea. And it's really important for us to consider this as a diagnosis because the management principles for this condition differ from the HOP protocol. Now, an impact brain apnea is for patients with a traumatic brain injury or head injury become apneic. Um, it results in traumatic cardiac arrest and it's a preventable cause of death if we recognise this early. The clinical features are that of apnea, a catecholamine surge during the apneic period, and then combination of both the hypoxia from the apnea and the catecholamine surge on the myocardium causes a cardiovascular collapse. And back in 2016, in the resuscitation journal, um, Drs Wilson and Hines presented some work which had previously been undertaken about 20 years ago in an animal model. 
um, where it described this, this impact brain apnea pathophysiology. Now this graph or this table, just to orientate you, the first line would be the spontaneous ventilation of the animal. You can see the impact that was um, mimicked on the animal model and how the, the animal then became apneic. During the apnea phase, you can see the bottom line, which is the hemodynamics. The blood pressure starts to rise as you get a catecholamine surge. And then as they ventilate the animal mechanically, eventually the spontaneous ventilation returns and the hemodynamics normalize. Now, if they went to leave the animal to uh, remain apneic, the hemodynamics would deteriorate and the patient would um, result in a traumatic cardiac arrest from a combination of both hypoxia and myocardial stunning. And with this in mind, the management of patients in impact brain apnea is that of uh, mandatory ventilation, so we're going to ventilate them. That might be with simple adjuncts in a BVM or with an endotracheal tube down. We're going to consider doing chest compressions because they have myocardial stunning from this combined effect of hypoxia and catecholamine surge, and they also need inotropy. So we're essentially managing them like a medical cardiac arrest in some ways. And you can see how this is contradictory to the traumatic cardiac arrest algorithm we've just described. And it's also contradictory to the basic life support uh, guidance that given to out of hostile cardiac arrest, which describe compression only CPR, because these patients need ventilating early. And this is why it's really important for us to recognize these patients. So if you have a patient who um, has a high mechanism of injury, they've fallen from a significant high, high speed trauma, then we're going to make the assumption that this is a hypervolemic traumatic cardiac arrest and we're going to follow our HOT protocol. If we have a patient who has had low speed crash into um, a barrier, for example, in their car, they've got no trauma to their body whatsoever, and they're fully restrained, then we're going to be thinking, is this a medical cardiac arrest? And then finally, if we have a patient who appears to have an isolated head injury who is in cardiac arrest, then we need to be thinking impact brain apnea because our management priorities are different and we will be doing a disservice to our patients if we don't think about ventilating them and doing chest compressions early. Diagnosing impact brain apnea um, conclusively is very difficult. The imaging um, CTs may be normal. You might see some diffuse axonal injuries, and there certainly may not be any space-occupying lesion on the CT head. So take-home messages from today's session. So we've talked about traumatic cardiac arrest, specifically looking at the two H's and two T's, so hypoxia, hypovolemia, tension and tamponades. We've talked about the HOT protocol and how this is appropriate for patient, the majority of patients in traumatic cardiac arrest with high energy trauma because the most likely cause is, that going to be, is going to be that of hypovolemia. We've talked about why chest compressions are controversial and some of the evidence um, supporting us not doing this in hypovolemia. We've talked about how it's important to get aggressive hemorrhage control, so closing the pelvis, pulling femurs, giving blood products. And finally, we've ended talking about impact brain apnea and keeping this in the back of our minds for those isolated head injured patients who probably need oxygenating, chest compressions, a bit of volume and inotropy to get a ROSC. And often when these patients with impact brain apnea, as soon as you oxygenate them and ventilate them, they ROSC quickly. Okay, thank you very much.